You are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. Porter, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Let's start off by talking about your number one investment, which is your kids. I know you have a son named Traveler. You t- sometimes talk about how you're going to go about parenting. W- what kind of approach have you taken towards teaching your children about like business, investing, society, politics, economics? I know you're trying to drop tidbits of that as they go a co- through the course of life. Yeah, the number one thing that I'm I'm trying to teach my sons is the same lesson that my father instilled in me. And I don't really talk about this much in the newsletter or really publicly, but it's such an interesting question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you in a little secret, which is that my father adopted me. And uh, uh, that a man chose me um, instead of, you know, the normal biological way, it made a profound impact on me. And I, I knowing that he chose to be my father, I always a lot more attention to the things that he said it did, maybe more so than other people. And uh, the, the biggest lesson that my, my father taught me uh, was that nobody owed me anything and that anything that I wanted to have in the world, I could have as long as I was willing to work hard and to, and, and to earn it. And uh, basically every lesson that my dad taught me just as a, uh, was another expression of those same principles. Um, you know, so for example, like one day we're watching television and I'm like, man, I sure do hate all these ads on the television, you know? And my dad says, well, without the ads, you wouldn't be able to watch the programming because nothing in life is free. And so lots of these lessons from my father about always trying my best and how nobody owes me anything and I shouldn't ever expect anything for free. And I, I try very hard to teach those same principles uh, to my sons, you know, in, in measured ways. They're only uh, seven and three years old. So, uh, you know, they're not out there uh, on a tractor yet working on the farm. But, but I just want them to realize the value of, of labor, the value of a dollar, how important it is to save. And, and most of all, I want them to understand that, you know, my financial success, whatever it may be, has nothing to do with them. It doesn't make them a better person. It doesn't make them a worse person. And it sure as hell isn't theirs. So whatever they want in life, they're going to have to work for just like I did. Well, thank you for um, kind of divulging that that piece of information about the dynamics in your family. What do you think was the utility, um, say, for example, a, a father having in adopting someone like you? Because you always talk about the market dynamics um, between you know relationships, even within families. What do you think uh, encourages one to just go outright and adopt you and want to have you as their son? That's a question you'd have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> do you it's have any thoughts on that, though? I can just tell you that I'm not interested in adopting. <laughs> right. I, I, don't, I, I guess people that, uh, people that want that in their lives, they have a different mindset about you know, how they want to spend their time and their energies and, and what the payoff is uh, for loving uh, other, other folks. I'm I'm very happy with uh, my wife and the two children I have, and um, it's a uh, it's not something that I would consider. So I know your children are relatively young now, and you often talk about the twenties being your learning years. Imagine if you could go back in time, or imagine if we can go forward in time where your kids are in their twenties. What is it that they need to be learning that you think so important that will lead to life success? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer unless you have some idea of what that person means by success. You know, you know, a great artist, what he's going to do in his 20s is he's going to learn more about, um, you know, the, the techniques he needs to master, uh, the different materials he needs to use, uh, different ways of, of, of performing and, and perfecting his craft. And that's totally different than someone who sees success as becoming financially independent or successful in business or wealthy or influential in politics. So you, you, you really have to start by, by defining what you want your life to be about, or at least what you want your first efforts in life to be about. And then the most important thing that I will tell you is find the person who is the closest thing to what you're trying to achieve and find a way to work for them, even if you have to work for free. And the way you do that, by the way, is not by – every time I say this, I get dozens of emails from people saying, oh, I'll come work for you for free. Uh, 
including uh, I got I got an email like, like that from um, a famous uh, mob family in New York as well. One of their one of their sons <laughs> tried to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. I'm com- <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> no 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 no. So you ha- to get that you what you really have to do is you have to bring something of value to the table for that person. So what you can do to get started, like if you wanted to get a job with me, for example, and you wanted to learn about global finance, or you wanted to be a publisher, or you were interested in online marketing, or whatever the, whatever, whatever the dynamics of my business that interests you, what you would do then is you would send me things. So for example, if it's finance, you would research companies that you think are great investments, and you'd share that work with me with, n- with no expectation of anything in return. That's how you build a relationship. You build a relationship, of course, by giving first. And so th- what I would tell my sons, let's say my sons wanted to be my, – my dream, by the way, for my children, and this is not what I expect them to do, but this is just my little personal fantasy. Right. Their, their personalities are very different. My oldest son is extremely um, – he's, he's, he's just got a beautiful, charismatic personality. He's kind and people are very uh, charmed by him very quickly, especially adults. He's a very charming little boy. I think he's going to become the chairman of Morgan Stanley because I see that as sort of the um, – the the, uh, the the penultimate or the ultimate um, uh, uh, position for a guy who's a master at social relationships and, and is very skillful as an investment banker. And I can imagine him doing that. And, of course, that's what appeals to me because I'm interested in finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, my, my younger son is like um, – he is just completely over-the-top uh, energy and enthusiastic. And he is – in a way, he's bombastic and rude. Um, and uh, he's very stubborn, and I can see him becoming a great hedge fund manager because he he's just going to always do his own thing in the world. And so, if I was trying to help my sons in their twenties achieve those two goals, you know what I would do is I would I would tell Traveler, my seven year old, to start working on deals to find investment banking deals that Morgan Stanley could organize and make a commission on, and and do the whole do the whole work, do the whole pro formas, and start sending those to bankers at Morgan Stanley to get their attention. You start doing their job for them, and you start doing it better than they can do it, and you're going to get a you're going to get an opportunity. Likewise, with with traveler with hedge funds, that's even easier. You just start sending them really good investment ideas, and you, you know you, you try to you try your best to ingratiate yourself to these people. You ask them for a chance to intern. You say, look, let me work for free for six weeks. But most of all, you have to prove to them that you, um, you, know, that you can do something useful and you won't get in their way. I had a chance to talk to Richard Mayberry about this, and I know you're a big fan of his um, Uncle Eric series as well. And he, we, talk, we discussed about like the components of, of natural law, for example, and the foundations of that. Um, are you going to discuss with your children about some of those components prior to telling them or encouraging them about what they're doing, perhaps they need to understand eventually on why they're doing it? I think the only ethical, hmm, in terms of philosophy and ethics, I think it's kind of what you're getting at. If I, yeah. if I get the question wrong, then you know, I'll answer it again. But I would like for them to read the Bible. I, um, I spent some time studying the Bible when I was a teenager, and um, – I think it's very – it kind of depends though. Times are changing. Where I grew up in, in the southern United States, um, people are extremely and overtly publicly religious. And if you don't have an understanding of where they're coming from, it can be very hard to relate to people. As you probably know, um, God doesn't whisper in my ear. And, uh, but but I, I still think it's important to understand the, those traditions so that you can understand uh, the people that you live around. Now, by, by 20 years from now – you know, there may not be a, a, a public uh, religious culture in the United States, so that may not be necessary. But then the other thing I, I would stress upon them is to understand um, the objectivist morality. And I learned this at a very, a very formative um, dinner party, actually. And it was, at, it was um, at a restaurant, an Australian steakhouse overlooking the Boond in Shanghai, very early in the Chinese boom. This is uh, 98 or 99. And my host was uh, Doug Casey, and we were there. We were there with a real scumbag. There was uh, maybe about twelve people at the dinner, and and we had run into the stock promoter in the lobby that Doug had known from some, you know, horseshit deal twenty years before. And so Doug invited the scumbag to join us for dinner. And w- what I think is interesting is I like going to dinner with scumbags. Now listen, I'll be very careful about what I'm saying here. You know, you have to be very careful who you choose to have as your friends. Because whoever you choose to have as your friends, that's who you will eventually become. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying I'd want to have a, a dinner with a scumbag every single night, and certainly not the same scumbag. But I do find um, these these fringe characters very interesting, and it just makes for a much more rich dinner discussion. So, you know, uh, if I could, for example, I would love to publish a newsletter and have all the editors in this one particular newsletter, which would be called Fallen Angels. It would only be by people who have served time because they were convicted for a financial crime. So I, I'd have my columnists would be like Bernie Ebers um, and uh, Madoff and uh, 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 Ken Lay from Enron. And it would be the most interesting newsletter you could ever read. Not that I, be very, I want to be very clear. I, I'm not, I'm not idolizing these people. I'm not romanticizing what they did. They did terrible things. Right. But I do think there's something interesting about the criminal mind. So it was interesting to have dinner with this guy. And this guy was trying to tell D- Doug that there was nothing wrong with ripping off investors because they should know better. And he was saying that, that you know, morality in that way is very um, malleable. Right. I'll, I'll never forget what Doug, he, 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 he very emphatically hit the, hit the table with his hand. And he said, that is completely wrong. He said, you know, their morality is completely objective. And he said, all of philosophy and all of ethics and all of religion boils down to two simple concepts. And all of law boils down to two simple concepts. Mm-hmm. And those concepts, I'm sure you know what I'm going to say, the concepts are do not aggress on your neighbor or their property. And number two, and that's, that's, that's the basis of all criminal law. And then number two is the basis of all tort law, which is do all that you promise to do. Those are the two rules. And so what I'm going to tell my children is, look, I don't care what you do with your life. It's up to you. You want to be a starving artist? That's fine. Do your best. You want to be a corporate titan? Great. Go to Harvard Business School. Do what you want to do. Do what you find fulfilling. It is your life. But whatever you do, know those two laws and do not break them. Do not aggress on people or their property and do all that you promise to do. Porter, how would you define property? Because I'm in, I spend time in Asia. We talk about like land rights, right? Fifty year leases. It's technically not yours. It's the state, but you can borrow it for fifty years. Um, you know, it's South China Sea territorial claims. How does one define property? Or if you take a look at the Middle East, right? Like, wh- what is the that definition that says, okay, well, this is property. This is your property, at least. Well, obviously, that changes depending upon the the, the legal structure of where you are. Right. Um, Baltimore, for example, in the city for a long time, we did, there was no such thing as free, uh, free and clear title. Mm-hmm. There were ground rents on all the houses when I moved here. And every year, I had to pay $25 a year <laughs> in right. rent just, just to have title. And if you didn't pay your ground rent, someone would come and take your house away. So. And in the United States, think about it. If you don't pay your property taxes, they'll definitely take your house away. So do you really own it? Yeah, I, I'd imagine some of the convolution of like law and stuff sometimes can complicate that definition of property. Uh, one of the key premises, like Isaac Newton talks about, standing on the shoulder of giants, building upon ideas. I mean, even you, for example, for some of your newsletters, you're going to use the foundation of some of your mentors, guys like Ben Graham. Um, you're going to take components of that. So. I guess the stealing of ideas is fine to some extent, right? As long as it's not outright plagiarism, nor if it's patented. Well, that's a very, very interesting question to get into. We could probably spend a lot of time talking. Could talk- be a long time. Uh, yeah. but definitely, um, the the search for those lines is something that is ongoing in common law and 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 also in patent law. I mean, it's very difficult to say. Um, but there are some established norms that seem reasonable to me. And unfortunately, I have encountered people who are plagiarizing me from time to time. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the, the existence of, of uh, intellectual property laws. And I've also seen publishers who were so protective of their copyrights that they ended up making their newsletters impossible to access. Right. Uh, and so um, I think that there are important legal but also more important uh, commercial considerations. For example, you're the music business. Mm-hmm. You've, you've allowed technology to make it easier to steal your property than it is to, to legally buy it. That is a commercial problem you have, not just a legal problem. Mm-hmm. You've, you've, you've got to change your model in some way. And, of course, iTunes came along and, and uh, some of those issues were resolved. So anyway, those are all very, very complex questions. But I will tell you that in the, in the, in the, in, in the scope of understanding what's right and wrong – in terms of um, objective morality, I don't think there's really that big of a, a question. 
You know, um, if I take ideas from three or five different people and I, sense, I synthesize them in a new way and I come up with a new expression that is unique and mine, I've got no problem with that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, right, if I take word from word from another writer and I put my name underneath the headline, that's clearly a plagiarism. Right. So I've never in my career had any problem distinguishing what's right and wrong in those regards. Um, and uh, I don't think I, – I mean for me, I just um, – for me, the, the lines seem very clear. Now, whether or not a judge would agree with my interpretation or not, I have no idea. Okay. Well, you know, we've covered a little bit of philosophy, life, politics. Let's talk about the currency wars and what's going on around the globe. Um, my hedge fund is invested in U.S. dollars. I've been so for the last several months. What golf do we claps, think about? Golf claps all around? Well, thank you very much. I've It's my biggest position, but it, it works uniquely actually within the portfolio because it's a currency rather than holding just all equities. Um, I talked to Rick rule about this actually, cause you know, he's a big, um, commodities bull. So he, at the end of the day, he has a big U S dollar position, even if it's just cash, if you want to call it that. But in this case, it's cash that's appreciating because of the, the currency that you own. Um, what are your thoughts on what's going on and are we all headed straight to hell? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I tell you, um, it is. Uh, I wrote this uh, recently that, um, and, I, and then I read. Um, I wrote this uh, this memo internally to Sean Goldsmith about th- this issue, and and then uh, the next day I saw the gentleman who runs uh, Elliott Management, the big hedge fund, uh, Paul Singer, I think is his name, and he had written an internal memo almost using exactly the same language. I don't think he plagiarized me. I just think we were having the same idea at the same time. And the idea is it is impossible to know um, how massive cr- the massive creation of money and credit will warp the world's economy. It is o- the only thing you can know is that the dislocations will be huge and they will be um, fatal. And l- let me give you an example of that. So let's say you're trying to stimulate inflation in a paper economy so that it's easier for your government and for your banks to repay their creditors. And that's exactly what's happened in the United States since 2008, since March of 2009, certainly. So we've created uh, $4 trillion in uh, new money, which is just mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. And we've created um, an additional, let's call it roughly $20 trillion in credit. And I say roughly because there's different ways of measuring credit. So, for example, the Fed decided to, to completely underwrite all of Fannie and Freddie's debts. And for a while, they decided to completely underwrite all of General Electric's credit as well. So, you know, that would, if you, if you took a more expansive view, you could maybe call it $30 trillion or $40 trillion or even $50 trillion. But today, there is a, a right around $10 trillion of more debt on the federal balance sheet than there was uh, in 2008. So that's the number I'm going to use, and it's a round number, so it's easy to understand. Mm-hmm. So you've, you've created a whole bunch of more money, and you've created a whole bunch more credit. And in the process, you have warped the, 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 the price of money. So you create more money, and it gets a lot cheaper, and so now you can borrow money uh, for next to nothing, right? You can borrow money for 30 years at 4%. In the United States, even if you're just a regular consumer, you know, buying a, a regular house. If you're, if you are a, a favored consumer, if you're a bank or you're a hedge fund or you're a big corporation, you can borrow money for almost nothing. And then there are places in like Switzerland where you can you can be paid to borrow money. It's just right. it's mind it's completely mind boggling. Okay, so what well, the impact of that has been in the United States that capital investments have become free. And so, you, and so the biggest thing you've seen in the United States is massive amounts of drilling for oil. <laughs> I mean, um, people don't realize the, the, the massive increase in CapEx in the oil industry. So prior, prior to 2005 or so, you know, um, the, the total CapEx for the oil industry in, in, any, in any given year would be, you know, 200, 300, um, 200 or 300 billion dollars. And now it's well over a trillion. So that's a five-fold increase <laughs> in a period of five years. So guess what's happened to the price in the supply of oil? It's cratered. And so instead of creating inflation, what you have actually created is an enormous deflationary pressure in the global economy because you've taken the price of energy and you've cut it by 90%. So what I'm saying is, if you think about this, we, we, you just don't have any way of predicting 
how entrepreneurs are going to use this additional credit and this additional money. And the way that has, that has been used so far hasn't stoked price inflation at all. Instead, it's led to massive increases in supplies. And so now you've got a problem where you know you have this issue where there's probably more supplies of things, whether it's timber or coal or copper or gold or silver or real estate or oil, uh, than there is demand. And uh, so in, in, in the attempt of trying to cure deflation, you may be causing more of it. This is, this, is, this is the point. You just can't know how the, you cannot know what will happen next. But, but you can know that there hasn't been, uh, you know, this much money created um, since World War II or since the Civil War, and that sooner or later people are going to lose faith in the paper currency system and they're going to abandon it in favor of things like gold and silver and platinum and perhaps trophy real estate and perhaps oil. Uh, so I don't know when, but I do know that sometime going forward, people will flee will flee these 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 paper currencies, and I don't just mean the dollar. I mean I mean the entire system. I've seen these two interesting studies, Porter. One um, was the McKinsey study, and one was from Oxfam, which kind of discussed about um, how the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and how risk is being socialized, and how public sector debt is actually increasing. Private sector debt. As a, in general, is um, decreasing slightly, but the where it's pronounced is within the financial services. So, if like I think uh, financial service um, sector ha- has deleveraged by at least twenty percent since the financial crisis, um, I guess my question is that yes, the money is being printed; it's being held up in certain industries. Will the entrepreneurs be able to exploit that if they're not affluent in financial services in some shape or form? That's one question. Number two is I always know how you like to talk about um, the socialization of risk. Um, Is the end game some kind of like multinational currency like the IMF? And if so, is the IMF even financially capable of providing that additional fail-safe? Because I think I looked at the reserves from the IMF, and it's maybe the same that was used to bail out the United States during the financial crisis, approximately like $750 billion. I don't know what your thoughts are. Uh, n- uh, the second question is easy to answer. Sure. No, I don't believe that we're going to see a global currency Ever, I just uh, I can't <laughs> I cannot imagine. Um, I mean, look what's going on in the in Euro right now, right? And the Germans are no longer willing to, to bail out the Greeks. Imagine if imagine if we and the Russians were trying to share a paper currency. It would just never work. It would ne- it would never work. I'd, so I'm I'm not worried about that. Um, and, uh, and and the first question about wealth disparity and uh, the effect on entrepreneurs. Um. <laughs> Definitely easy money and credit is a boon to entrepreneurs, and um, that can have great benefits to society. The trouble with the amount of money and credit that's been created and the way it's being distributed is that it so obviously and grossly um, empowers the wealthy. And just as an example, Heinz Ketchup is one of the greatest businesses that's ever been created in the history of capitalism. It's one of the great global brands. It is dominant in its market. It is high margin. It is a wonderful cash gushing machine, and it will be for at least the next 50 years. Um, So it is a trophy asset that rightly belongs to the Americans who have owned it for, you know, however long, a very long time. And yet... um, it was possible for, uh, for, for Warren Buffett and his partners in Brazil to borrow money at less than 3% to buy it. Mm-hmm. So you see in the, 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 the way that cheap capital enables private equity investors to acquire unbelievably great assets with almost no actual equity. Porter, I know you have... So- in your newsletter about world dominators. I think this will tie into what you're, you're going to lead to as well. You talk about world dominators, which I also define as probably oligarchs, right, to some shape and extent. And guys like Warren Buffett, which is also an oligarch, is able to buy these assets cheaply. But can the average guy do so besides getting that exposure on the secondary market 
which is probably sometimes not as attractive as, you know, getting these inside deals, mezzanine or like, you know, something. No, they're nowhere nowhere near of attractive. And what you have to understand is it's not the difference in price. It's the difference in equity funding. Mm -hmm. So if you go out, if you go out to buy a stock, your broker will allow you to use 50 percent margin. Heinz, Heinz and, the, and the guys from Brazil, they bought, they bought that company with like 5% of the equity down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, what, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying is there's been an enormous aggregation of wealth because of the low cost of capital. That has enabled folks who have access to capital via reputation, banking relationships, etc., cetera, to, to, to simply aggregate enormous resources. And, and I believe that, more than any other factor, is responsible for the grave disparity of wealth. And, and one thing about the disparity of wealth that I'm not quite sure anyone's really thought of yet, there, are, it, there is a bigger difference between the top the – top, um, so if you, take, if you take – instead of taking the whole population, if you just look at the 1%, if you look at the 1% of Americans that have the highest incomes, okay – and then from that, people, let's say there's a thousand of them. I know there's more than that, but let's just say there's a thousand people. Mm-hmm. If, you t- if, you, if you look at the top 10% of that 1%, so the, you know, the top uh, uh, 0.1%, there is as much disparity between their incomes and the 90% of the others. You see right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So there are between 1% of the total population and 99% of the population. So the, the, the real issue is a, a, is an, a, a, a tremendous uh, accumulation or aggregation of wealth and a remarkably small number of people. And those are the people, of course, who have access, access to unbelievable amounts of capital. You know, why is Carl Icahn able to buy whatever he wants and make companies do whatever he wants? Well, it's because he's managing $40 billion. Right. Why does everyone pay attention to what Bill Gross says? Because at one point, he was managing $800 billion. It's, yeah, there, I think there's about 1,650 billionaires in the whole world total. Um, what, what do you think is the arbitrage? I know you have a lot of retail um, readers that are reading your newsletters. Yeah, they can invest in some secondary market opportunities. But, you know, what, what's for Traveler? What is his arbitrage? I know besides your Rolodex, assuming if Traveler didn't have that Rolodex, what can he do? You discussed about reputation, building a reputation, is it still possible for someone like you to start from like a bedroom writing newsletters and make your way through financial services? Is that possible this day and age? Oh, of course. Yes. There will always be room for talent for sure. There will always be possible for people who are willing to work harder than other people to succeed. Uh, I'm not saying that this, I'm not saying there's anything, hmm, I, I don't see the aggregation of capital that's occurred in the last 20 years as being a, an impediment to success at all. What I'm saying is it is a negative externality of the policies that have, that have driven our country forward. So an, an effort to manipulate the markets to make credit cheaper for, on behalf of the government and banks, the side effect of that is you made, che- you made credit cheaper for uh, the, the corporate oligarchs, as you call them, right. and the result has been a huge aggregation of wealth. And the, the danger of that is what if these people who are controlling all this money make mistakes? Uh, much better for the economy, going to work much more efficiently and, and have much less volatility if you've got millions of people making small economic choices instead of one person making enormous economic choices. So you're saying that there's still a meritocracy that exists within the current landscape, right? If, if you do have something of value or you can identify that, which I, I would argue some of the barriers of entry for that is a little bit more tricky, though, this day and age. But if you can offer something of value as a small player, um, there's some appetite for that. Oh, come on. Absolutely. And, and by the way, um, size is absolutely no sin cure for performance. H- how, many, how many times in the last 10 years has Warren Buffett underperformed the S&P 500? Well, what's interesting, though, is Warren Buffett's... 40, four times. 40% right. of the time. He, you know, since 2000, he's made less than 6% a year in his equity portfolio. People, not many people realize how bad his stock picking has been over the last 15 years. Before so check this out. His for, the first 35 year, for the first 35 years of his career, this is a guy who was averaging you know, close to 30% a year in stocks. In the last 15 years, he's averaging less than six. Check this Sock, one out, though, It's been a huge problem for him. His net worth has actually increased by 23% last year. 
You know, you know what I mean? Despite the stock performance as an individual, he's getting that much more wealthier. That's like he's for doing, guys like you he can, and him. He continues to make a lot of money in insurance and he continues to make a lot of money from his wholly owned businesses. Right. Um, but, but, but I'm just saying that this is an example of how size is not necessarily uh, a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I also, don't, I also don't think it's a good thing. Really, I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, I think that it's dangerous. I think this aggregation of wealth is dangerous because it will lead Americans to believe that the game is rigged against them, which is something you were expressing in, in a way. Mm-hmm. But more importantly, I think it's bad because you, you know people making important economic decisions, uh, you want there to be lots of, of, of people experimenting. You don't want to have one guy deciding what the policy will be. I'll give you an example about that. We were talking about Boone Pickens. I'm, gonna, I'm going hunting with him this weekend at his ranch as his guest. Right. And, and, and Boone was an enormously wealthy oil guy who controlled a lot of policy because he was an investor in, in just about every onshore U.S. oil company, and he was highly regarded. And, of course, he was very wealthy, and he had a, a big hedge fund called BP Capital. And he was convinced that oil prices would never go under, under, under $90. And he was one of the leading advocates of this idea of peak oil, that we were going to run out of oil. And as a result, he was lobbying the government for the last 10 years to use all kinds of national resources to force people to switch to natural gas. Mm-hmm. Well, if we had done all that, we would have maybe never developed the shale fields. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So. I'm glad there wasn't a king of energy. I'm glad that there wasn't a guy who was dictating the energy policy for the, all the United States. I'm glad instead that there were millions of entrepreneurs who had access to capital and were experimenting. And so I, I worry uh, the more that the capital and power is aggregated, I worry about the, di- the, dy- the dynamic nature of our free market uh, being, being um, overshadowed, uh, being left behind. It sounds almost inevitable. Right. Unfortunately, at this juncture, unless something dramatically changes. Well, that's what Piketty says in that terrible book he wrote. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about. I don't. I don't agree with him at all. By the way, I think the book is a, is a joke. I think I don't think the guy understands anything about how capital compounds, and I don't think the guy understands anything about how uh, how risky it is to uh, to make large in, large investments of capital. Right. What happened? What happens, in fact, is that rich people inevitably make mistakes and huge amounts of capital are destroyed. And in that process, um, pr- productivity is increased and wealth is distributed. Aren't, aren't you one of those proponents of saying that capital is never destroyed and it's just transferred from one location to another? Oh, no, no. Capital is destroyed all the time. <laughs> Come on. For sure. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.